So the next presentation is by Jochen Hemming of Wageningen University, talking to the development of mobile fish phenotyping device. Welcome again, Jochen. Hello, my name is Jochen Hemming, and I work as a senior researcher, computer vision and robotics at Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. Today, I would like to talk on one of our research projects. This project is on the development of a mobile fish phenotyping device. Wageningen University and Research has the mission to explore the potential of nature to improve quality of life. On our campus, we have a group on agrofood robotics that researches and develops computer vision and agriculture robotic systems for the different sectors, such as the open field agriculture, the protected horticulture, fresh chains and food, and also livestock, and last but not least, marine. We have a group of experts in artificial intelligence, sensing, especially multispectral and hyperspectral sensing, on machine learning, deep learning, and computer vision. The Aqua Impact Project is a European funded Horizon 2020 project with a consortium of 11 companies and 13 research institutes from nine different countries. In Aqua Impact, we integrate the fields of fish breeding and nutrition to increase the competitiveness of European aquaculture. Aqua Impact develop products and services based on genomic selections on the four species you see here on the right. Currently, measurements of traits in breeding programs of fish are labor intensive, they are subjective, and they are also slow. And part of our work in the Aqua Impact project is to develop technologies for high throughput phenotyping using machine vision methods. One requirement of such a device is that it must be able to measure on living fish. This fish is out of the water, it is sedated or anesthetized, but we have to limit the time that this fish is out of the water for the well-being of the fish, for example. The prototype we are currently developing uh, can be seen on the picture here on the left. It is a small mobile device because it should be able uh, to get transported to different um, places where measurements are taking place. It consists out of a box that shields environmental light. There's artificial light included and um, a conveyor belt goes through that device transporting the fish that is manually inserted here. And um, next to a tag reader um, that reads the tag by RFID of the fish, uh, the most important components are the cameras we have inserted. There's one camera here on the top that takes images from the top of the fish, from the side. And there's another camera here that faces the front part of the fish and produces images as shown here on the right hand side. Um, we de developed this apparatus together with the company Dorset in the Netherlands and as cameras we use uh, not only color cameras but we use cam color cameras that also produce uh, depth images, 3D images based on active stereo. To give you a little bit of an idea how that apparatus works, I will show a very early stage uh, laboratory testing of that device. So you see here that the fish gets inserted and it gets transported. Inside the cabinet, it stops to take the images and make the measurements, and then the fish is transported out. Normally, in normal operation, the door is closed, of course, to shield environmental light. Um, also, there is an integrated scale in the conveyor belt that measures accurately the weight of the fish on the conveyor belt. 
Here's some example images and some basic image processing operations uh, that come off, out of this machine. Uh, in the middle, you see um, the distance image, the 3D image, where the color tells you something about um, the distance from the object to the camera. So the more yellow orange, the closer the object is to the camera. And we can use that 3D information for volume measurements. From the set of images, we can easily extract all kinds of 2D traits, such as length or width, the area, shape properties, roundness, and other derived values. Next to that, we can also measure calibrated color features. And as already said, we have the full access to the 3D information, so we can also measure volume um, of the full fish or of certain parts of the fish. The big advantage of having a 3D system is that we can uh, make use of extracted, automatically extracted landmarks to assess difficult to measure variables, difficult to measure by hand variables, such as specific um, body areas of body volumes. And that gives us much more possibilities than the manual trade recording that it used at this moment. The next step in this project is that we will combine the output of the image analysis with the genetic information we have available from our database about the genetic correlations, for example. And by that, we hope that we can unlock the full genetic potential for the breeding programs. We will develop machine learning based real time selection algorithms for these breeding programs such that the machine can directly classify the fish into a fish that will be used for the breeding program and a fish that will be sorted out. Our key needs for further progress on that topic is that we need a very good contact and interaction with all kinds of stakeholders, such as fish breeders, but also machine builders. Um, and on the other hand, we always seek to team up and to share knowledge and also facilities on the area of artificial intelligence, of deep learning, also on the fish breeding and, and all related topics. And we do this typically in joint research projects. What we really need is funds that subsidize these kind of high-tech developments um, because only then it will be able to set the next big steps on these developments. This already concludes my short speech. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Joachim, and your team for giving us the insights there. That, that reminds me very much of the value of the crossover that exists between fisheries and aquaculture and the ability for you know, in your speech, how we link ex expertise and link ideas. And it brings me back to Amanda's suggestion of an AI marketplace. And I wonder if uh, you, you mentioned you're looking for funds to develop, but what opportunities are there for collaborations to see working across teams that are working on similar, similar questions to offer advantages instead of battling alone on, on certain issues. And I wonder how I already see that you, you're linking the genetic teams with the engineering teams with you know in controlled environments and the aquaculture but how would you see for example the Vakan and teams linking in with maybe an international cooperation marketplace where we try to set out key themes where people working on different areas could go to share ideas share code share opportunities for for funding and so on yeah Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, this is that is the the topic, I would say. Indeed, um, as a little bit explained, and also my colleague Angelo explained yesterday. So uh, we we are not coming from from the marine sector. So we took we come from the plant research group of Wageningen. And, and the interesting thing was to see that the same uh, hardware, if it comes to cameras, but also the same software that we use to classify, for example, a flower or a pot plant. Uh, can be used in a very similar way uh, to different products uh, like the fish. Of course, there are also new challenges there, but 
So that is, uh, that's very nice because the same kind of technologies can be applied to very many different uh, domains. And indeed, and that also comes very clear here when listening to all the other presentations uh, during the past two days, that there's a lot of things going on in the world and it is that does not make so much sense to reinvent the wheel. So you really should team up. And that is also what, what we always try to do. Right? We always seek uh, uh, collaboration. And then of course there are different mechanisms to do this. And the European Union, they have these European projects that we can, uh, where we can acquire. And that is also already an international cooperation, but, but uh, yeah, there are also possibilities beyond that. Uh, and and um, yeah, also sometimes it's a sort of bilateral agreement several, several countries have uh, to, to, to do joint projects, but, but it goes much more beyond that. And we in Wageningen, I think we are, we are always open uh, uh, um, to, to, to step into these kind of uh, collaborations. Uh, Matt, do you have any questions for, for Jochen? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, not, not so much collaboration, but really sort of technical um, thought process. Uh, I've worked in hyperspectral, multispectral uh, sensing uh, in agriculture on drones and also underwater transects of reefs and uh, aquatic ecology uh, and, and gathering 3D spatial data as well. Uh, obviously, uh, can be incorporated with LIDAR if we're looking at uh, crop production. Um, what lessons have you learned from combining 3D data and hyperspectral data um, with fish? Uh, what, what, and, and how have you handled the 3D data as well? Um, are you producing uh, uh, vector data sets, meshes, and then uh, giving the algorithms measurements from those to look at the reflectance values? Uh, how are you handling that data pipeline? Very technical think, question, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, first of all, it's a massive amount of data. So we're really talking about this magical big data you have to deal. And, and certainly, if you want to approach that in real time, that, then it gets a big challenge. I, I think we are still quite at the beginning when it comes to having combined data of 3D and hyperspectral and 2D and so on. So that 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 is uh, there. There the research is really, really at an um, yeah starts just had started, and there are so much more possibilities still. But we also see the the large potential, of course, because uh, um, yeah, 3D is something um, when you go more into detail that 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 you cannot assess easily and objectively with the human eye. So, and also for sure, the hyperspectral. I mean, this project which I just showed here that that does not make use of any spectral information, but there are other projects that, that are doing this. And, and there's a lot, uh, a lot of uh, things to, uh, to win, actually, to use this information. But then the, the, the issue or the, the challenge is to, to get this data processed in, uh, in the available time. And maybe it's a little bit comparable to what in the previous presentation, there's an enormous amount of video data collected and you only need a very small fraction of that to really extract the information. If you record the full hyperspectral data set, then you have a lot of information that is not useful. And then you need clever and smart tools to extract only the useful information. That's great, Jochen. Now, I've actually got another question for you from Anton Allenbrook. He's from the information and knowledge management section of the fisheries division in FAA. Yes, coming from your data collection perspective. So, what is are there any steps already on going on for calibration of and and for the validation of instruments to measure fish or uh, plants or whatever you have in front of your camera? And do you also see that as a role where international organizations like FAO can have a a sort of a stake or help to define the standards and um, classifications for optical and other uh, me uh, measurements on life and innate objects? Yeah, good question, I would say. I think uh, if it comes to projects that uh, like these documented fisheries and so on, where you have re really sort of legal tasks or where you try to, to yeah, to use these automatic systems for, for doing uh, like sort of certified measurements, 
then I think it, it will be essential also to, to specify and to, to, uh, to put some norms out or to develop them and to specify them when it comes to uh, calibration and, and these kind of things. Yes, sure. That's not something we are looking at, to at the moment, but I, I, can, I can imagine that certainly in the, the fishery, um, there, there can be a very important task and if you if you use that information not only to sort of to make the profit for the uh, let's say the fishermen better because they can sort their fish or something like this, but you really have to supervise and you have to be sure that you have um, collected uh, the right information. Then then the question of giving out uh, uh, norms uh, and regulations will be a very important one. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Jochen. I just want to add one point. The, the idea of norms and standards is not necessarily only for compliance. It's the ability for these data sets to then become very shareable between groups. So if we can try to agree, and this is one of the things about an agency like FAO, it's not really an agency. It's an amalgamation of all the country's governments and getting them together to decide on the standards that they want to use often allows greater sharing. So let's see where we're going with this but let's let's move on thank you very much Jochen, for the presentation and yes. um,